Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. If you've turned off your cell phones, just tell your friend to call me. I'll leave mine on and take messages for you. If some of you are upset with our president or some of his predecessors, if some of you believe that he or they ignored the law or the Constitution, well, uh, the fault, uh, dear Brutus, you don't mind if I call you Brutus, do you? The fault, dear Brutus, uh, is not in the stars, but in ourselves, for we elected him and them. But in all fairness to ourselves, the fault also is in the Constitution and in our first president, George Washington. The Constitution says, and I quote, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States, but it fails to, dis to define executive power, and it fails to say what the president should do with it, other than execute the office of the president, whatever that means. It means nothing. And that's exactly what the framers intended. The president was to do nothing. The framers wrote a constitution that made him a figurehead. They made him commander-in-chief of the armed forces, but only when Congress called the armed forces into action, which left the president commander-in-chief of no one and nothing. Other presidential powers, if we can call them that, were no greater. He could make treaties, but only with the advice and consent of the Senate. He could nominate judges and heads of executive departments, but again, he could only seat them, put them into office with the advice and consent of the Senate. And once they took office, he had no power to get rid of them. He couldn't fire them. They'd be there forever. And still worse, the Constitution ordered the President to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, but it gave him no law enforcement arm or powers to arrest or punish any violators. So when Washington took office, he really had no powers under the Constitution. And, and again, that's exactly what the framers had intended. They had lived for a generation under the tyranny of an absolute monarch, George III of England. And they were not about to let their new president become another King George. So they created a figurehead. And that's all George Washington was when he took his oath of office as President of the United States, a figurehead a beloved old man that other founding fathers had put on the throne hoping he would smile and nod off to sleep. James Madison, who helped write the Constitution, explained that in our government, and these are Madison's words, in our government the executive department is not the stronger branch of the system but the weaker. That's what Madison said and what the framers believed. And to the distress of millions over the years, that's exactly what we've often had. But the framers forgot one thing. The name of that first chief executive was George Washington, father of his country, commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, the man who had galloped into a storm of, of musket balls at Monmouth Courthouse, the brilliant general who won an eight-year war of independence with a bunch of farmers against the most powerful, well-trained, well-equipped army on Earth. This was a man who, on his own, had studied history, law, economics, national and international affairs, and literature, and become, he had become one of the most widely read of the founders. This was a man who had transformed a small tobacco plantation into one of America's largest, most diversified agro-industrial enterprises stretching across 20,000 acres. He was CEO of what we call a conglomerate today. It included a fishery, a meat processing plant, textile manufacturing and, and weaving plants, a distillery, a grist mill, a brick-making kiln, a cargo-carrying schooner, and endless fields of, of grain, tobacco, fruits, and vegetables. His trading operations stretched to the West Indies and over to England. He was an immensely successful and powerful chief executive in peace as well as in war. And when he took the oath of office to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, he intended 
doing just that, even if it meant ignoring the letter of the Constitution at times to preserve the spirit. Only a few months after taking office, Washington shocked Congress and the nation by assuming authority over four centers of government power that Congress had hoped to control, foreign affairs, defense, finance, and law enforcement. He waged war without congressional consent and then borrowed from banks to pay for government expenses. The Constitution did not give him power to do those things. Only Congress could appropriate and authorize spending of government funds. Only Congress could declare war. But Congress, uh, Washington did both on his own. Now he knew that everything he did would set precedents for generations of his successors. But he ignored the Constitution again and again to create what James Madison later called a monarchical presidency, what modern scholars today call the imperial presidency. Although largely associated with more recent presidents in the 20th and 21st centuries, the imperial presidency was the creation of George Washington. Washington combined political cunning, daring, and sheer genius to seize the powers he needed to deal with the crises that he faced during his eight years in office, often when Congress was in recess. Members, members of Congress then lived far from the Capitol, many days away, even weeks, over muddy trails and treacherous, dangerous, sometimes impassable dirt roads. Washington faced crises the framers of the Constitution had not foreseen, and he had to act on his own to protect the nation and its citizens. Now, obviously, not every president is made of the same stuff as Washington. I won't name names, but weaker, indecisive presidents, men without Washington's leadership qualities have often let their powers slip away, sometimes, sometimes to Congress, sometimes to the Supreme Court, sometimes into thin air, just letting the nation drift leaderless because they don't know how to, sh how to steer the ship of state. They say one thing one day, the opposite the next, and, and the nation just drifts. President Carter admitted the nation at, during his administration was drifting in a sea of malaise. But Washington knew how to steer the ship of state. Most Americans today think he only faced crises during the Revolutionary War, but he ran into crisis after crisis from the moment he took office as president, with his life at, in danger at times. Now, I'm not going to tell you about every uh, crisis, because I uh, want you to read my book. <laughs> uh, but I will describe a few of them, including a rather a curious one about how to address the president. Uh, this came up at the beginning of his presidency. And during the Revolution, people addressed him as General or uh, Your Excellency. But when he was president, they didn't know what to call him. There were no precedents. Ours was the first elected president in world history. No other nation had ever elected presidents. One senator suggested calling him His Elective Highness. Vice President John Adams, who uh, liked the pomp he had seen in Europe, suggested calling Washington, His Highness, the President of the United States and Protector of the Rights of Same. Well, the titles got sillier and sillier until one senator got tired of it all and shouted, why don't we just call him George IV? <laughs> well, James Madison ended the debate. He reminded Congress that the Constitution prohibited titles in the United States. He said they'd have to address the president as they did every other citizen, Mr. President. Members of Congress then tried to decide what to call each other and whether any of them deserved the title of, of the honorable gentleman. The Senate voted no. The problems of titles didn't end there because Washington had to seek the advice and consent of the Senate with a draft of a treaty his war secretary, Henry Knox, had worked out with the Indians. Now, in the Senate, the presiding officer uh, was